Hello, everyone. Today, I would like to welcome my colleague, Catherine Vu, who is the owner of Proactive IT Management. She took a risk as a woman entrepreneur a number of years ago in a male-dominated sector of IT and ended up being very successful. Proactive IT is now a recognized force within the Alberta IT community and has a Silicon Valley development project to their credit. Building on a foundation of best-in-class practices, technical expertise, and responsive customer service with integrity, Proactive IT has grown from humble roots into a thriving customer-centric computer solutions company with raving fans across Alberta. As an immigrant to Canada, Catherine believes in playing it forward and is dedicated to giving back to her community. She has a huge list of volunteer activity and raises tens of thousands of dollars for many different causes. Here is a list, a short list of some of them. Alberta Easter Seals, Winifred Stewart Association, the Alberta Cancer Foundation, Bust a Move, and Suit Yourself. I am really happy to welcome Catherine Vu to the Culture and Leadership Connections podcast. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Marie. It's a pleasure to be here. Maybe you could fill the audience in a little bit more about who you are personally, because that was a a great little bio about you and your company, but let's hear a little bit more about you. Uh, So I came to Canada in 1981 with my mom and two sisters. Um, We were sponsored by my dad who left Vietnam in 1975. And I, uh, well, our family tried to escape earlier um, by paying passage to a boat, but that didn't go well. We got caught, got sent back to Vietnam in 1979, and we waited a couple of years. And finally, in June 2000, uh, 1981, we were able to uh, come over by a plane. So we took a flight from Vietnam to Thailand to Vancouver and then Edmonton. And uh, so I've been here since 1981. Uh, in 1994, I graduated from U of A with a BCom specialized in accounting. I didn't get a job offer with any uh, accounting firms except for two, but I didn't make the shortlist. So there was no job to be had. Um, I ended up working for a company, an IT company doing marketing that's owned by an accounting firm. And I did that from 94 to 97, where uh, the sales, a senior salesperson that we hire convinced me that we could start an IT company. And I I wasn't sure how that was going to look. I never had a vision of being an entrepreneur, but I thought, you know, what do I have to lose? Um, I have great families. So if I ever failed, I can always um, go back to, to get them to help me. But uh, so we started with a $1,000 uh, credit card and um, cold called and learned. So so we have a IT company with that. And then 2003, I went out on my own and formed proactive IT management. And 15 years later, I've been an entrepreneur and can't imagine doing anything else but entrepreneurship and i love to give back to the edmonton community through volunteering to fundraising and that's kind of all started because my brother uh daniel was born in 1991 with down syndrome and i thought the only way that we could learn to support and help him was to be involved and that's how the philanthropy stuff of my company kind of got going, I guess. Well, Catherine, I think that you really have a lot of dramatic obstacles in your life that you had to overcome. And, you know, coming, trying to come in a boat, being sent back, coming and starting your life uh, with your family in Canada, having to learn a new language, having a brother with Down syndrome, so many things that you had to overcome and not being able to find work right away and then starting an IT company when you actually didn't have an IT background. It's really, it, it, when I first met you, I, I remember meeting you at a networking session and I thought, oh, this woman really stands out, somebody who really gets things done. <laughs> and also you were very striking in your confidence and your enthusiasm. And I'm just wondering, uh, just 
sort of as an aside, is that confidence something you always had or is that something that you built over time? Uh, I think that's definitely something I've built. Um, I was always a little involved in school, but quite quiet and shy. I was a brain. But um, I think being an entrepreneur, it kind of forces you to get out of your shell because you need to connect with people. You need to sell. And um, I, that's just how I've kind of grow. And I guess the more you're out there and connect with people, the more confidence you got. But I remember in 2003 was when I first kind of start doing networking, where I go out and build a network. Um, I guess I had a, a networking buddy who is a male and it kind of gave me more confidence to kind of walk into a, uh, a room and not feel so intimidated because a lot of time it's mostly men in those rooms. And it's, it was nice to have a male networking buddy that can kind of introduce you to the group and kind of get you going. Cause once I, once I have a, um, chance to meet people, then it's awesome. It's just that hesitation when you walk into a room, you know, it's overwhelming and you kind of have to push through that fear and just talk. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's really interesting. The idea of having a, a networking buddy and, and also the idea of just, you know, stepping past your fear and saying, I'm going to keep doing this. And then what, the other thing that stood out when I first met you a few years ago was that you said, I love cold calling. And I have never met a single person in my life who says they love cold calling. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's because my ex-partner, um, he was a cold calling, like, guru, I guess. So he trained me. And that's how we build our original company was one cold call. Uh, one client at a time, and it's all through cold calling. It. I remember meeting, like even having contractor that works for us that I've never met face to face, and it was all, uh, all the relationship was built on the phone. And I can be pretty persistent, but uh, not annoying, I guess. So I just wanted to touch base with people. And I guess once you learn to cold call and know that a no is just, a yes is just, you know, a few no's. <laughs> after a few no's, then you just keep doing it. And, and that cold calling skill actually helped me with my fundraising for charities was I, I know that, you know, you never know what people would support, but until you ask them, the answer is always no, right? So that's my, that's my philosophy now is, is always to ask because you never know what the answer is until you ask. And hmm. once you can ask a lot of amazing opportunity is open to you. Yeah, that's great. Because really, if you don't ask, you just assume it's going to be a no. That's right. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you the question about your childhood. So probably there are some incidents or some experiences that stood out in your childhood that you think helped to make you into the leader that you are, and uh, that contributed to your sense of self. Can you recall some of those? Um, I think uh, the the one that you know I, I mentioned that we tried to escape from Vietnam and when we got caught and um, we were sent home to our uh, back to Ho Chi Minh and with no money and essentially what my mom did was she just talked to townspeople and a lot of these people didn't have a lot of money but they were always very open to feeding us or giving us just a little extra. And eventually we made it home. And even though I was really young at that time, it made a significant impact in me. And and I've tried to be helpful wherever I can. I mean, I know that panhandling is not encouraged, but I don't think I can walk past one without giving something. And especially if they ask me, I can never say no. So I guess that did make an impact because you never know um, what their story is. Is, is how I, I I like to see it because you know we were we made it home to our back home because of the goodness of very poor people and uh, I just wanted to repay that back. That's a beautiful story because in fact when you do surveys on neighborhoods that are most charitable it's often the poorest neighborhoods that give the most yes. uh, and the most frequently it's not the people with the most money. So if, when people who say, well, I'll give when I have the money, 
those are the people that never will give. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or I'll help when I'm feeling stronger myself. So then you never become strong because you haven't helped. Yeah. I mean, so, I, I mean, giving is just everybody have a philosophy, right? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and that, I guess that's just my philosophy and my sister's the same. And I remember when we first came back to Vietnam in 2008, after being here since 91 and 81, I mean, I was swarmed by, by little kids because they come and ask you for all kinds of stuff and sell and I would buy. And then you technically have a following because <laughs> <laughs> I guess that you, you get tagged as an easy mark, but you know, that's, that's just me. I'm very friendly. And so, I mean, we even have the, the same incident when we were in Colombia because I would talk to people and there is a lot of, uh, of people not begging, but really pushing their wares on you. And so I, when I have a conversation, they expect me to buy all kinds of stuff. And uh, yeah, because that, you're, um, you're seen as the rich foreigner, right? Rest to me a few times. Yeah. So you, you went from, from being the one who had to ask for help to the one who's seen as the rich foreigner. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. So from the groups that you were born into, because it's not, you're born into Vietnamese culture, obviously, but you're also born into a family and you're born into other kinds of groups too. There might be a religion that, that you were born into, could have been a region. So from any of those groups that you were born into, what would you say has most influenced your sense of culture and self right now? Um, I think it's, it's respect for people. Um, you know, uh, Vietnamese people, we have to, we're, we're kind of taught from an early age to respect our elders, to take care of our elders. And, and, and that's kind of where I come from. It's family and focus on how can we help each other. And I know when my mom raised us, she kind of raised us to be, you have my trust until you break it. And if you break it, good luck trying to get it. And that's kind of how I run my business because I don't know the technical part. I have to have a lot of trust in the people I work with, my contractors, my, my partners, my, all, all those people that I interact with, I just completely trust. Even my competitor, I have no problem sharing how we do things because I feel like we can be better when we're all kind of in it together to help the clients. And um, I've been burned a couple of times, but overall it's, it's, it has helped me really learn from others and have faith that people do good thing and and that's how our clients are treated too from our consultant and because I have trust I don't micromanage my people I just let them do what's best and when you really trust people to do a good job most of the time they rise to the occasion and if on occasion you get burnt it's a lot less than if you would assume that they were all out to get you in which case everybody's going to burn you exactly yeah um I, I have that philosophy that whatever you think is true will be true. <laughs> right. Because you create your own reality. So I wanted to ask you, Catherine, about your personality. And pe people often think personality is just one thing, but I'm going to divide it up into two. Temperament being what you're born with and personality being the piece that you develop as a result of having to respond to your life experiences, your education, and the people that you meet. So let's start with temperament. What would you say you're born with that has influenced your sense of who you are culturally and uh, as somebody who takes charge and is a leader? Uh, I think it's um, independence uh, and uh, kind of easygoing. I'm pretty adaptable right from the beginning. I mean, I remember my dad left when we when I was four four and a half kind of thing. And uh, my mom has to work and I was the oldest of three girls and we're all one year apart. And I just kind of was really good at just taking care of my sisters. And I guess it's just, I just go with whatever is the present adaptability. And that kind of has made my personality to be very adaptable. Like I just wrote, <laughs> go with the flow, I guess. And, uh, and that positivity is, is, is definitely, uh, my t personality now. So it's just that easygoing stuff. Independence, adaptability, and a positive outlook. 
And yeah. those those would be the things you say that you were you were born with, but yeah. then you you probably also made them better because you just kept practicing them. Yeah, I've just learned that the more you are positive, the more good things happen. So you know that positive reinforcement. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, this is working. So let's just do more of it. That's that's my <laughs> philosophy. Exactly. If it's not working, why why repeat it? <laughs> and if yeah. it is working, let's do more. <laughs> yeah. So I, at, yeah, I don't really know any other temperament that I am. I'm, I think well, I'm the, pretty low key. So meaning that you don't you don't get easily flustered. I don't get um, I don't get fresh like upset very often. I guess I'm pretty easygoing that way, and mm-hmm. um, not sure where I got that from, but. I've been known to say, well, people can insult you and just kind of roll off my back. <laughs> half the time, I don't get it. The other half, I'm like, well, you know, if I, you can't control what people think. So that's kind of like my thing. I don't worry about things I can't control. That's great. Yeah, that's And not worrying about things you can't control is probably something you learned later on in life, right? Yeah, no, that really has helped because um, like, I think... With my three sister, I'm definitely the least worried, the least. And then there's my other sister who's very, like, she she just, she's a worrier and she can't stop it. And my husband's kind of similar. So I don't get that because I'm like, I always evaluate um, when I'm stressed. I'm like, is this something I can control? No, then I just kind of let it go. And uh, the personality that um, I kind of develop over the years, just that that willingness to try new things and just push my boundary and then realizing how much fun I have doing that. And so I just seek fun stuff because that usually pushed me out of my security conscience that I like security safe stuff. So doing fun things kind of pushed me out of that little zone and kind of challenge that a little bit. But it's also something that doesn't feel like a threat because if it's fun, then yes. the anticipation is bigger than the threat. Yes. So, and then you try the new thing and you go, hey, that was fun. That wasn't at all a problem. And then... Yeah, because you... sometimes I think in your head, you make it out to be a lot harder. <laughs> exactly. It's always, we always imagine things to be much worse than they were. Even in really horrible situations, we can still imagine them to be much worse. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it's always best just to, to do it, I think, because sometimes, yeah, in my head... I always say, like, if I try something new that's kind of nerve wracking or whatever in my head, it's like I'm trying to figure out all the things that the worst thing that could happen is usually how I I deal with things. And then I'm like, can I deal with that? OK, then I pursued. <laughs> and those are two really good traits to have as an owner and a manager. So if you think, is this in my control? Yes or no. If not, I'm not going to get all worked up about it. If it is, then what what do I need to do? And yeah. Yeah, I think that, that's that's very helpful. And then to also be able to evaluate what's what's coming up as the, in the same way. So if other other people are in that particular situation, you can help them to see if this is going to be what's the worst thing that could happen. And you can put their fears at rest by letting them know. Uh, so they go, oh well, I mean, worst thing that could happen, I could die, or I could lose my job, or those are worst things that could happen. Yeah. Uh, all right, I guess this isn't so bad after all. <laughs> so. I wanted to ask you also, Catherine, can you recall a time when you were aware that what you understood to be normal, it it would be like a cultural norm or something that you understood to be normal, wasn't normal when you met somebody else? And that's when you would become aware of the fact that you had your own cultural ways of doing things. Hmm. I don't remember what we use for this answer. (laughs) Well, I think A lot of times people notice this through food experiences when they're children. They go to somebody's house and they realize that other family eats things differently than they do. When I was five, I went to my first birthday party and I went to an Italian family and they had made they made pizza with Parmesan cheese on it. I had never eaten pizza and I'd never smelled Parmesan cheese before. And I was terrified of the party just because of the strange smell and the strange food that I and I, it's funny because I grew up with several other cultures that were friends of my parents and they had lots of different foods. For example, my Japanese food, Jamaican food. I didn't find that strange, but I found 
going into the home of my friends that my Italian friend and 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 having that the pizza experience and the parmesan smell which I love now but at the time I was just scared of it in fact I even turned around and ran away <laughs> did you ever have an experience like that uh, well, I, when you say about food it reminds me of when we first came to Canada in uh, 1981 and my dad has the philosophy that we're all just really thin and he needs to fatten us up and just have us eat nutritious stuff. But we're not used to that. And I remember um, like being forced to eat cereals with milk. <laughs> and thinking how yucky that was probably. <laughs> it is. It's so gross. I cannot even to this day eat cereal and milk together. Like... <laughs> Because normally you would be eating... I'm not a fan of pizza either because I remember my dad would order pizza and we couldn't leave until we eat everything. And so we would sit there and, uh, I mean, my sister, they like pizza now, but I do not like pizza. I mean, I'll have a piece. I find that it's very rich and heavy when you eat pizza. So I struggle with stuff like that just from flashback from ouch, my childhood. So... <laughs> So he was I trying know, kids try... love pizza, kids love cereal and and that's very foreign for us when we first came from Vietnam because we don't have that. Like we don't drink milk from, you know, just I don't yeah. I, to this day I don't really drink milk. Like I'm lactose intolerant anyway. But milk is, is something I just don't drink very much of it. So you if probably at all now I, I don't think I have milk. Right. You know, in, in, in a decade, at least, unless it's kind of and cream stuff like that's really stuff that I'm not used to eating. So that's definitely a culture norm or even Halloween. Like we've never done Halloween, even when we first came to Canada. So when people talk about uh, things that are nostalgic to them from childhood, like certain candies, I have no connection to any of that. Well, it's pretty typical for a lot of Asians to not know um, dairy products and to find dairy products repulsive and um, and way too rich and you're probably healthier as a result <laughs> <laughs> my problem is I just love food I just eat a lot of it <laughs> doesn't matter how healthy you eat if you eat a lot of it it's still not good <laughs> well you still look slim and trim to me oh that takes a lot of hard work <laughs> Yeah, so a lot of times people experience cultural difference first through food and then other kinds of things come up too. But we're we're looking also in this podcast for connections between leadership and culture in the workplace. So if you were to give some tips to an employer who was going to hire you and you could just say, listen, this is how you would work best with me, what would you tell that employer? I think, um, you know, Vietnamese or Asian people are, are known for how brutally honest they can be. <laughs> Good way or bad way. And I kind of took, that's definitely innate in my personality. So if they, the best way to deal with me would probably communicate exactly what it is you expect from me. And then for sure I will deliver. I don't like to second guess, but at the same time, I learn really quickly. And so I discover this as um, a thing that I need to work on and my leadership is that because I learn quickly. When people don't learn that way, it's um, it causes friction for me because I get frustrated that they're not getting it. But then I, I learn that I have to step back and make sure that they're very clear on what I expect. If people ask me to do something, they only have to say it once and, and I get it. But I know that not everybody as in my my role, not everybody is made that way. So now I've learned to communicate not only in saying it, but writing it and trying to be really clear for people that don't think the way I do. But if they were to, but if I were to give tip to an employer on how to deal with me, it would be like being honest and forthright and just let me know exactly what's expected of me and I wish for sure deliver that and above. Right. Well, I think that many of the people I've interviewed on this podcast so far have that same issue with not being able to identify when people can't learn things quickly. And many people have said that they had to really learn to practice patience and 
look at the other person and see what it is that they're facing or what obstacles are in the way because if if they were doing it them, themselves they would be 10 or 100 times faster and yeah, uh, that's and, really and, hard and, as a business owner to delegate right cuz you could do it faster and sometime in my first few years learning that i would just take it over and do it but now i know that that doesn't help me or the individual or the company so i've definitely learned to take a step back and and let them do it in their pace and be okay with that. Yeah, patience is definitely not uh, uh, <laughs> my strongest uh, strength for sure. Uh, but I think maybe that's being an entrepreneur. You just go, 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 go. Or, and I'm go, go, go more than other people. So it's definitely a good reminder when I'm faced with people that do not go at that speed. And, you know, I, I do seek those people out now because I feel like they make me a better leader. Right. You want to surround yourself with people who are a compliment to you, not who are the same as you. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely fun to be around people that are like you for sure. <laughs> it is. Yeah. You can probably get some pretty quick-witted jokes happening too. Yes. But diversity is is important and way more powerful, right? So if we can expose the group. I mean, with my staff and contractor, we have a mixture of age, a mixture of race, a mixture of gender. So I think, um, I don't know if I purposely uh, set out that way, but that's definitely how it's working out. And it's, it's, it's one of the best team I've ever had. Yeah, diversity really helps to see the whole picture. And uh, I was just working with a group yesterday where we used the story of the seven blind men and the elephant, where seven blind men are walking along a road together and they run into an, an elephant, but they don't know what it is. So each of them tries to describe the animal the way they see it. And one person says, oh, this animal is like a tree trunk because he was by the leg. And another one says, oh, this animal is like a snake because he was by the trunk. Another one said, oh, this animal is like a broom because he was by the tail. And then they had a big argument about who was right when in fact, because nobody could see the whole elephant, they were all wrong because they were all missing significant pieces of the whole picture. And so when you have a diverse staff, everybody contributes and you get to see the whole elephant. Mm -hmm. That's a cool story. Yeah, it's a story from India that I somehow picked up and I just, I thought it was, it's useful for so many different things. Is there anything else that you'd like to say about you as a entrepreneur or as uh, somebody who has been growing your business or anything that sparked your interest from the ideas about culture and leadership? Yeah, I guess what I call myself is the accidental entrepreneur. But I have always have that philosophy of learning from others. And um, I think if we were to go to life just having that always curious and learning from others that we can become better leaders. And uh, culture, it's interesting because I've lived in Canada way more, way longer than I ever lived in Vietnam. I mean, I was only 10 when I left there, but it fascinates me that the culture is so embedded in to me as a person that, uh, you know, that respect and that taking care and, uh, and just gratefulness, I guess, from the opportunity that's presented to me since I came to Canada that I just, I love being an Edmontonian and a, a Canadian. And that pride is what I like to share with the world. And because I'm an entrepreneur, I get to do and be exposed to many opportunities that I encourage people to, if, if they have any curiosity about it, to just go for it and and just explore and, you know, give it all you got because entrepreneurship is a phenomenal thing. And, and now that's that's what I do to give back is just mentor other entrepreneurs that are younger or, you know, starting out. Which is great. So do you have um, anything that you would like to promote? Because this is your, your spot here. Do you want to promote your company or some venture that you're working on, some, on, uh, some uh, philanthropic thing? What would you like to let the audience know about? Well, since I put it out there that I want to double my company, <laughs> and even though I do a lot of networking, I know a lot of people, I don't usually promote proactive IT and talk about IT with other people. So it's been a, um interesting six months. And I think last Thursday when I had um, back-to-back events and, and training and stuff, and 
I remember coming home and telling my husband how proud I was that I was promoting proactive and asking people that knows me, like, who do they know that can use IT support? I mean, we, I mean, IT support is pretty generic, but I feel the, the kind of support we provide to our clients is unique to us. And it is a fit for a certain company who don't want to pay a monthly fee and they just want on demand outsource IT from a company that want to grow with them and, and do what they, what we can together to give back to Edmonton. Um, that, that would be a good fit for us. And, um, and then I support a lot of charities. Like I'm a Stollery Woman Network, a thousand women for NorQuest. So if cancer, any of those things, just, I guess, just encourage people to see how they can make a difference in Edmonton. And then if everybody have that mentality, our world is better just because we're all doing more than we did the day before. That's a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much, Catherine, for that very inspiring interview. And I really appreciate your time. And And thank you for inviting me to be on this podcast. It was a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Culture and Leadership Connections with Catherine Vu. Catherine is an outstanding businesswoman, and she has really accomplished great things. From being too direct to being too happy, Catherine Vu has been judged as all extremes, but she remains unfazed as a Vietnamese female entrepreneur finding success in a Canadian male-dominated industry. She shared with us how her positive approach to life has helped her navigate a sea of professional decisions. Underlying all of Catherine's actions is an unrelenting focus on supporting and encouraging others. Catherine is always working in communities and credits her success to her willingness to be generous with her time. I would love it if you would rate our podcast and share it with others. And you can also leave me a voice message on Voxer. You may just find that your comment is on an upcoming podcast edition. Thanks for listening and may culture and leadership insights Help us all to build happier, more inclusive workplaces.